Uh, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about Russian stuff, a little bit about SETI stuff, and a little bit about uh, the game I'm working on. Uh, I'm really happy to be here at Earth tonight because I happen to be quite a Russian space buff, Russian space history. Now, I grew up in the 60s, which was kind of an interesting time. Uh, it was actually a lot of social turmoil going on, civil rights stuff, Vietnam War. But at the same time, there was this very hopeful kind of optimism about the future and progress and where technology might bring us. You know, we were all supposed to have personal jetpacks, of course, nuclear powered cars. And this is actually a Ford design called the Nucleon. And it was nice to put the nuclear reactor a little bit behind the passenger compartment. And of course, big space colonies orbiting the Earth. And, you know, potentially there was at least this idea that we might live in kind of a racial and, you know, national harmony, you know, sometime in the future. Now, of course, when I was growing up, you know, the Apollo program, the Gemini program, the whole space race was kind of in full swing. And for me, that kind of defined the future. Now, that was obviously where we were going. I was building models of all these things, following all the launches very closely. And I remember very vividly watching the Apollo landings, you know, on my three black and white televisions that my parents had set up in our house. There was this big party. And of course, my parents were all freaked out that we were landing on the moon. It just never occurred to them that it would happen in their lifetime. And to me, I just kind of grew up with it. Of course, we're landing on the moon. And this movie, 2001, which is my favorite movie ever, came out. And, you know, at the time, I didn't realize that the future was unpredictable. So as a seven-year-old, when I first saw this movie, I assumed that's exactly the way the future was going to be. You know, I was going to be taking Pan Am space, clippers up to space, and etc. And also that we would have really intelligent, interesting, homicidal robots and computers out to get us. And this actually sparked kind of my interest in computer technology at the same time that it was sparked my interest in space. It was interesting in 2001 when people went and saw that movie. They saw Hal and he was, you know, having natural conversations with people. He could even like read lips, and of course people took that for granted. But they walked out of the theater saying there's no way he would beat that guy at chess though. We didn't understand human intelligence at that point. And in fact, you know, there were a lot of things in studying things like robots that helped us kind of redefine what we are as humans. And I'll kind of get back to that a little bit later. But at any rate, you know, so 69, we landed on the moon. And so it didn't seem like much of an extrapolation whatsoever that 30 years later we would be building cities on the moon. Now, if you imagine 30 years before that, 1940 to 1970, that was a huge amount of progress. And so it seemed just natural that we'd be there in 30 more years. And of course, a lot of the space program in the early years was kind of couched in this space race between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And it was an interesting and kind of a competition. You know, as a kid growing up, I was exposed to NASA and their plans and all their missions, the blueprints of everything. Whereas the Russian space program was always this black box. It was very secretive and mysterious what they were up to. Uh, which, of course, just fueled my curiosity. And I became very curious about kind of what they were doing. Now, one of the interesting things about the Apollo program, once we got to the moon, actually, was us looking back and for the first time getting this image of the Earth from space and realizing that really, you know, we're on this small planet all together. From up there, you don't see you know, boundaries and borders and nationalities. And so I think going to the moon, this is probably the largest lasting impact that the Apollo project had, was this view of the Earth. Most people don't know it, but when we landed on the moon, the people in Moscow, the Russian kind of mission control, were applauding. You know, so for the first time, you know, what used to be the American space program and the Soviet space program really should be thought of as the human space program. And in some sense, there's this whole shared history of our space program that we were kind of ignorant of. You know, a lot of us have heard about kind of the NASA side, but still, to this day, the Soviet side of that space history has been shrouded in mystery, even though a lot of it's most of it's now public. So I want to share just a little bit about that with you. Now, of course, our programs had a lot of the same roots. There was this rocket, the Blue that was designed to bomb London. And after the war, you know, the Americans captured their German scientists, the Russians captured their German scientists, and studied the B-2. Then the Russians designed the R-7 ICBM to bomb America. And basically that evolved into their primary launch vehicle that they still use to this day to launch even NASA astronauts up to the space station. The Americans, of course, were kind of going down a different path. In fact, Werner von Braun's plan for the A-10, which was the successor to the V-2, was designed to bomb New York. But that multi-stage design became the basic design for the Saturn V that took us to the moon. So basically, you had these things that were designed to bomb America, London, Russia, whatever, and they all became kind of the basic technology for our space programs. Now, we were going down the same path with the Soviets for a long time, the first decade of the space race. First, it was kind of, you know, who put the first satellite in orbit? And the Soviets kind of got spun up first. We followed with Explorer. 
Then the first animal in space, which was like a Russian dog. Then the first man in space, of course, Yuri Gagarin, who went up 47 years ago to this day, which is why we're all here to kind of celebrate this event. Followed by Alan Shepard, first spacewalk, Alexei Leonov. And around it, you know, this early years, it was really one guy who was responsible for the lead that Soviets had and all these firsts that they were achieving. A guy named Sergei Kolyev. He was the chief designer of their space program. He was a very competent engineer, but more importantly, he was a brilliant kind of politician and bureaucrat. He knew how to navigate the system and kind of get the resources he needed to apply to the space program. In fact, the Sputnik launch originally was almost kind of an afterthought. They were designing the R-7 as an ICBM. And he talked Bruce Stubb into having an extra rocket, saying, oh, by the way, you know, I can launch a satellite in orbit. They can give me one extra rocket. And Chris said, you know, okay, go ahead and try it. I don't think either one of them realized the huge impact that that would have on the world psyche when they launched Sputnik. And as soon as Bruce Stubb saw the publicity he was getting, of course, Cordia was getting a lot more resources poured into his program. And he basically knew how to build that very well. But unfortunately, he died in 1967, which is really about the time that the Russian space program kind of got a little bit off track. Now, around that time, also, NASA was starting to catch up with things like the Gemini program. And, of course, they eventually made the first lunar landing. So up to the, this point, the Russians were actually trying to build a lunar landing. They couldn't get their launch boost with the N1 working. So basically, they kind of scrubbed that whole idea of going to the moon and kind of went off in a different path. And this is what's interesting, because we were going down the same path here in the first two years. But after Apollo, our two programs diverged into kind of totally different areas. At that point, we weren't really competing, but we were really specializing. Basically, each side avoiding what the other one was doing. So NASA was focusing on interplanetary probes, a few landers, really with an emphasis on exploring Mars. Also things like reusable technology, the space shuttle, which was amazingly advanced for its time when it was first designed, and you know, very powerful instruments like Hubble Space Telescope. Whereas the Russians were doing things like rovers, they did the first rover on the moon in the early 70s. Uh, they were focused on exploring Venus. They did a lot more early Venus exploration than the US did. And their space station program, which started with very simple little stations in the Salyut program, and recently became more and more complex up to Mir. And the amount of time and effort they spent on the space station programs was very large. Now, just to kind of give you an indication of the two different approaches that the science will take the engineering, which I think is almost indicative of a philosophy that they brought to space flight. This is the control panel from a Mercury capsule in 1962. This is a control panel from a Vostok capsule in the same year. You can see they're roughly the same complexity. The Mercury is a little bit more complicated. These are basically the entire control panel for these spacecraft. This is the control panel for a Gemini spacecraft in 1966. And at that point, right around that time, the Russians first started to find the Soyuz. This is its control panel. And at this point, you can see the American one's getting a little fancier. 1970, we have the Apollo. This is the control panel. The Russians were still flying the same Soyuz, the same exact control panel. 1980, 10 years later, we designed the space shuttle. This is the cockpit of the space shuttle. The Russians were still flying the same Soyuz they designed back in 67. 1990, we redesigned the space shuttle. The Russians were still flying the Soyuz. They did a minor update to their control panel. To give you some sense, this little square here is how big that Soyuz control panel is. And basically, it's also interesting if you look at things like this, where the circle is, is a little globe, which is exactly the same navigation instrument they used back on the very early Vostok missions. Close up of this is it's called the Globus Astrogator, and this is their primary navigational instrument up until the mid-90s. Basically, it's a little planet Earth globe that's rotated mechanically, almost like an electric clock mechanism, with crosshair showing where they were. And it worked. It never failed, so they never replaced it. It is very pragmatic, very cheap. Whereas NASA was always kind of exploring the boundaries of technology. You know, what technology could we bring to space flight? And so they're very different, but equally valid approaches. In some sense, what the Russians were doing were exploring what was pragmatic in space flight. What could they do with the least? Uh, whereas the Americans and NASA were exploring what was possible. What kind of new technology can we bring to this endeavor, and what will that bring us? It's kind of instructive to look at when the Chinese launched their first manned spacecraft. They did basically a rough copy with the Shenzhou of the Russian Soyuz because it was so much more pragmatic for them. You know, they didn't involve all the super high tech that somebody like the space shuttle does. Now, when Gagarin went up, uh, it was really kind of a shock to the world, uh, like Sputnik very much. You know, when they were basically getting his Vostok ready to launch, he kind of drove out to the launch pad, you know, about halfway to the launch pad, he had to go best, really bad, so he got the truck driver to stop, and he got out and peed on the front tire. And since that time, every Russian cosmonaut, male and female, halfway to the launch pad, stops and pees on the front tire.